Now, we have a keynote address from Dr. Tim South Pomasan, who's a race discrimination commissioner and a very good, good friend of the National Centre for Cultural Competence. Dr. Tim South Pomasan has been the race discrimination commissioner since August 9, 2013. Not 19, 2013, 2013. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to joining the Australian Human Rights Commission, Tim is a political philosopher and held posts at the University of Sydney and Monash University. His thinking on multiculturalism, patriotism and national identity have been influential in shaping debates in Australia and Britain. Tim is an adjunct professor at the School of Social Sciences and Psychology, Western Sydney University, and chairs the Leadership Council on Cultural Diversity. I'd like to invite Tim up to the podium. Oh, and thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Deputy uh, Vice Chancellor. So, uh, it's like all of the data, but uh, it's been a few years ago. I'm going to also acknowledge that the daughter of the wife of the NCBC, and also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, I'd like to re reflect today on cultural competence and questions of racism. Uh, but before I do, uh, three vignettes or stories which I believe illustrate part of the challenge we, we have today in talking about cultural competence and, and racism. Uh, many of you will be familiar with, with these three examples, one of which relates to a segment on Breakfast TV a few weeks ago. You may have already spoken about it. I won't uh, re revisit too much of the circumstances, but perhaps a little for the benefit of our international uh, visitors uh, on one of our top-rating breakfast programs. You had a panel discussing uh, child abuse in Indigenous communities. There were three panellists, none of whom were Indigenous. Uh, the uh, segment proceeded to uh, suggest erroneously that uh, white Australian families could not adopt uh, Indigenous uh, children. Uh, the panel proceeded to include comments from one of the panellists about how a stolen generation of Aboriginal uh, uh, children occurred in the past and may need to occur uh, again for the benefit of Indigenous children. Uh, I'll give you a second incident in recent times uh, and, and may, may again have already been mentioned but concerns cultural safety and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. Uh, outrage broke about a new code for nurses and uh, midwives which mentioned white privilege and a decolonizing model of practice. Uh, this was a code uh, I believe uh, uh, which attracted some commentary in, in Queensland initially, but media commentators were quick to denounce the code's supposed requirement that nurses and midwives announce or declare their white privilege or apologise for being white before treating a patient. Uh, according to Graham Haycroft, the founder of a breakaway nurses' union, Nurses' Professional Association of Queensland, uh, and I quote, uh, it's an insidious form of racism and it's going to end up with a form of apartheid in the health system. Um, a few things with that. One, there was no requirement of uh, nurses or midwives uh, having to declare uh, their, their, their white privilege. Uh, uh, and uh, it was interesting to, to see, nonetheless, that there was a great deal of mileage made out of this in various forms of of media. And then this week, a story in the Daily Telegraph, yesterday's front page, also buried in the news pages in today's edition about emergency departments in New South Wales hospitals and policies towards Aboriginal patients. Among other things, in New South Wales hospitals, staff are encouraged to consider ways to ensure Aboriginal people are treated in appropriate ways in emergency waiting rooms, for example, through the use of designated Aboriginal waiting rooms or otherwise culturally appropriate spaces. According to one commentator in The Australian yesterday, this policy is, quote, horrible 
retrograde and an example of good intentions gone bad. Uh, the commentator then proceeded in, in his column to invoke Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. To give you a flavour of uh, what this involved, let me quote, it is a simple, true and worthy aspiration that is being turned on its head by modern identity politics. We should be doing all that we can to improve health outcomes for Aboriginal Australians, but different spaces and different standards are not the answer. This just fuels division in our society. It is not a solution, but a bureaucratic bungle that wastes time and money and can only do long-term harm. Our political class clearly has lost the plot and is completely out of step with mainstream standards and expectations. Martin Luther King would be turning in his grave to see how modern progressives have become so confused that they look to reintroduce segregation. Um, so I'm not verbaling. Anyone, I've, I've, I hope I've given uh, a, a very fair representation of what was said. Uh, for me, these three examples illustrate, uh, among other things, three, three things. Uh, one is uh, just the, the lack of voice that First Peoples have in Australian media, uh, and it's a, a lack of voice that many other communities also suffer from. Uh, I would say this is true as well of uh, non-Anglo, non-European uh, backgrounds within the Australian media landscape. Uh, when we have discussions about race issues or about Indigenous affairs, they more frequently than not, in fact almost invariably, do not involve the voice of the people who are affected by these issues. There is a distinct lack of representation and a lack of agency. Uh, a second point concerns what I see as the ongoing challenge of uh, talking about cultural competence today. Uh, there is still clearly a section of the community who do not understand uh, that enjoying equal treatment and dignity does not necessarily mean being treated in identical fashion. Uh, and on top of this, there are people who still struggle with understanding uh, that formal equality may not be enough, that you might need substantive forms of equality or expressions of equity, um, that if there are people in our society who experience disadvantage or discrimination, there may be good reasons for us to devote particular attention to that issue. Uh, third, I believe all of these examples illustrate something about power and privilege and race. Uh, many of those who enjoy power or privilege because of their racial background may not even be willing to acknowledge it. Um, in fact, there is clearly hostility towards even raising power, uh, uh, questions about power or privilege around race. Uh, it's hard enough for us to have sensible and reasoned discussions about race, uh, but when you throw in questions of power and privilege, uh, any hope uh, of, of having a reasonable conversation seems to be easily lost. Uh, but if we are to deal with questions of, of race, uh, surely we need to go beyond mere platitudes about equality or simple insistence that racial differences don't matter, because they do uh, matter. Uh, and, and here is the challenge I wanted to reflect on um, today a little. Uh, which is the, the challenge of having a shared language for talking about racial difference. Uh, there's a related and more fundamental challenge as well in ensuring that there is a willingness on the part of people in society to listen to the lived experience of others and to reflect on their position. Uh, now, I don't have simple answers to how we can resolve these things uh, because they're not easy problems to solve. Uh, it requires constant effort, constant vigilance, uh, but that's all the more reason then for us to get our arguments straight and to get our thinking uh, lined up. Uh, I'd like now just to reflect 
on what I regard as the structural and institutional manifestations of racism today. And I'm not going to tell you anything that's new, but I do believe it is crucial that we recite the facts and that we do, in a manner of speaking, sing from the same song sheet here, right? particularly if we are going to um, advocate for progress in this area. Uh, in thinking about today, I, uh, and, 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 and having come across uh, that invocation of Martin Luther King Jr., I, I went back to Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail where he, in which he reflects on the nature of racism. Uh, there's one particular passage that, that struck me, and I quote, I must confess that over the last few years I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shall our understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Um, what I get from that passage is the insidious and subtle nature of, of racism. Uh, we can talk all we want about explicit or violent forms of bigotry. We can all condemn uh, acts of racial abuse when they are visible uh, but that sometimes leaves the hidden reality of racism, which is something that lives not only through actions, but through laws and institutions, through culture and through attitudes. Uh, they are there in the rules and the norms and the systems that exist in our society. Uh, dealing with this is, is much more difficult than dealing with the Ku Klux Klan style. Um, of racism. Uh, and it's difficult in part because it requires a certain confrontation of reality. Uh, if you think about what Australian society looks like today and how it thinks of itself uh, today, I would say there's enormous goodwill for cultural diversity in the broader sense. And, and this isn't uh, just my intuition or or feel of the vibe, um, this is what the research tells us. Um, so every year, the Scout Foundation conducts an exercise of social attitudes, uh, and it has found for the last uh, 11 years uh, that about 85% of people will say that they believe uh, multiculturalism is good for the country. Uh, if you look at the findings of uh, social studies on uh, attitudes towards non-discrimination, uh, a very large majority, uh, about three-quarters or four-fifths of people uh, would endorse the principle of non-discrimination. Um, so I, I think you're always going to get a hard core of people who are going to have deeply intolerant views. It could be anything between five to ten percent, uh, but to see findings constantly over time illustrating that about 85 percent of people uh, are open to diversity, um, in my view, is, is, is a positive um, finding. Uh, certainly very different, or somewhat different, to what you'd find in other Western liberal democracies. Uh, if you were to survey people in the United States or the UK or in Europe, uh, I don't think you would find 80% plus uh, endorsing cultural diversity or multiculturalism. Uh, you would get a, a, a much different finding. Uh, even so, uh, racism persists, and it persists not only, as I said, in attitudes, but, but, all, but in our formal institutional settings. Uh, we all know, for example, that uh, there are still parts of the Constitution in Australia which permit racial discrimination. 
Uh, in fact, there are two clauses in the Constitution which do this. Um, the race power, um, section 51, subsection 26, still gives the Commonwealth a head of power to make laws with respect to any race of people, whether that's for their benefit or their detriment. Uh, section 25 of the Constitution still permits uh, uh, people from being potentially disqualified from voting in state elections because of their race. Um, the Racial Discrimination Act has existed since 1975, but it is still subject to being uh, overridden by other laws in Parliament, uh, as it has on three occasions. And in each of the three occasions that has happened, it has related to Indigenous affairs. Uh, if we were to look beyond the Australian Constitution for examples of institutional racism, we need look no further than the experience of First Peoples. Uh, we know, for example, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people are about 17 times more likely to be incarcerated, uh, despite being 3% of the general population, according to official uh, measures, about one quarter of Australia's prison population is Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. Um, health, and again, I'm not going to dwell on this um, too long because you already know it, uh, the disparity between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians when it comes to health is alarmingly large. Um, I, I do want to mention one recent report conducted by the Anti-Discrimination Commission in Queensland of the 16 public hospital systems in Queensland where they found uh, that there, there was uh, high to extreme uh, levels of institutional racism in all of the 16 public hospital systems. Um, Ten uh, of those systems were rated as having extreme levels of institutional racism, um, uh, uh, but all of them were rated as having high levels of institutional racism. Uh, if we were to look more broadly uh, as well, if we look at the character and composition of our institutions today, uh, we also see signs of structural discrimination at play. Uh, think, for example, of, of who's in our parliament, who leads our publicly listed companies, uh, who leads our public universities, or uh, uh, who is there in our government departments. Now, getting a picture of what leadership in Australian organisations looks like is difficult because we don't actually collect comprehensive data that's disaggregated on ethnic or cultural background in contrast to many other uh, advanced democracies. Um, but what we, we've done at the Human Rights Commission is conduct a research exercise ourselves where we have looked into the senior echelons of leadership to see the representation of diversity. Um, now, as a uh, in terms of the general uh, population, we, we can say this, that uh, about, about three-fifths um, or 60% of the Australian population would have an Anglo-Celtic background, uh, about 20% would have a non-European cultural background, about 18% would have a European non-Anglo-Celtic background, and about 3% would have an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander background. Uh, but if you were to look at uh, the ASX 200 CEOs, 95%, uh, uh, this is based on our figures in 2016, would have either an Anglo-Celtic or European background. There, there is not uh, one person in that cohort of CEOs uh, who appears to have an Indigenous background, uh, just 10 who would have a non-European background. Uh, and that's the best performing sector. Uh, among all the sectors we looked at. We, we looked at. Uh, representation got lower if you looked at the federal ministry. Uh, it got lower still if you looked at the secretaries or directors general of federal and state government departments. And it was a similar pattern within the group of university vice chancellors. Uh, we've current, we're currently about to release some new research which has looked into the second tier of leadership as well to investigate whether the pipeline looks somewhat different. Uh, they'll come out next week, uh, but I can tell you that uh, the findings won't necessarily surprise you.
Um, and, you know, this is perhaps a conversation for, for another um, day, but I was struck listening to, uh, to, to, to John and Michelle earlier and to, to John's reflections in particular about his experiences in, in academia. Um, if you would ask me what explains the lack of diversity coming through our ranks in organisations today, I, I would say a lot of it has to do with the cultural default and how people carry themselves in organisations or the images and expectations that you would have of what leadership looks like today. Um, for some in our society, there, there would be no question of feeling uncomfortable or feeling out of place, no matter how young you might be uh, or how unqualified uh, you might be uh, in, in, in your experience. Uh, there are just some who uh, gravitate naturally to assuming positions of leadership and part of that may well reflect how privilege plays out in our society. Um, who, who gets rewarded? Um, who gets the benefit of unearned um, uh, advantages? Um, a little bit more about how we, we, we talk about uh, racism um, today. Um, if we are to get things right, we, we do need to move beyond some of the simple questions that constantly pop up in our discourse. Uh, whenever we have a controversy involving race, uh, we seem to ask ourselves uh, in, in public debate, is Australia racist or is Australia a racist uh, country? Um, uh, the more I reflect on it, the more I find it interesting that we don't seem to be asking this as much as what we used to, by the way. Um, this reflex doesn't come up as often as it, it might have uh, uh, once did, um, which in itself uh, is interesting to reflect on. Uh, but the questioning reflects this view that any kind of criticism of uh, the country constitutes... Uh, an un-Australian act or an unpatriotic gesture. Um, for some, any suggestion that racism even exists in Australian society is taken as a grave insult. Um, now, I, I think we've got to try and unpack some of this, and I, I think it'd be, be easy for us just to say that this is the reflection of some uh, natural order or of a certain system at play. Um, it might reflect that in part. Uh, for me, I think it perhaps reflects more the way that racism is defined in the minds of people, which goes back to what I said earlier. Uh, this idea that uh, racists are bigots, racism is about white supremacy and a doctrine um, that if you're not a card-carrying member of an extremist organisation, you couldn't possibly be racist. Um, now, if we were to, to take that interpretation and give uh, some a measure uh, the benefit of the doubt, um, I, I think it might go some way to explaining, for example, uh, the cognitive dissonance that many of us might detect uh, in casual or everyday acts of racism or in the carelessness that people have on race. Um, and I'm thinking here, just to pick one example, of the uh, almost weekly occurrence of blackfacing uh, or when people dress up in uh, offensive or insensitive ways uh, and there's a script that people follow, right? Um, even in 2018, you're still going to hear people who dress up in blackface and when caught, caught out for, for doing so will respond, but it was just, it was just a bit of harmless fun. Uh, I was just doing that for a laugh. You're not going to find anyone who's less racist than I am. I don't have a racist bone in my body. And in fact, I find it more offensive that you were questioning me or suggesting that I'm being a racist. Um, you, you see how the, the cognitive dissonance plays out? And now, I think if we were to step back and, and pause and unpack that, um, some of that might have to do with the, the image of, of what a racist looks like or what racism constitutes. Um, but what if we weren't to define racism in, in the way that we currently do? Uh, the British writer uh, Rennie Edo Lodge uh, raises this question in her, her book, um, why, I'm not talking, why I'm no longer talking to uh, white people about race. Um, 
and she says, and I quote, if all racism was as easy to spot and denounce as white extremism is, the task of the anti-racist would be simple. But racism thrives in places where those in charge do not align themselves with white extremist politics. The problem must run deeper. We tell ourselves that good people can't be racist. We seem to think that true racism only exists in the hearts of evil people. We tell ourselves that racism is about moral values when instead it is about the survival strategy of systemic power. When a large proportion of the population votes for politicians and political efforts that explicitly use racism as a campaigning tool, we tell ourselves that such huge sections of the electorate simply cannot be racist as that would render them heartless monsters. But this isn't about good and bad people. It isn't about good and bad people. Um, and it isn't about intention or motive alone. Uh, racism is as much about impact and the effect that it has on people. It's not always about what is in people's hearts. Um, that's, that's one thing I, I want to say. The, the, the second thing I want to say about this is that we've, we've got to do better at highlighting uh, and explaining the banal forms of racism, particularly when they appear with the face of respectability. Uh, respectable racism is done with a great deal of sophistication, uh, which is why responses to it must also be sophisticated. Um, we, we are yet, I think, to, to crack how to, how to dismantle such forms of racism. Uh, one reason, perhaps, is the way that we talk about colour or difference. Um, and, and I want to spend a little time now reflecting on colour blindness, uh, because this is part of the default response, particularly from, from those uh, of a majority background to talking about race. Um, one, the vast majority of people are, in a basic sense, comfortable and relaxed with cultural and racial diversity. They nonetheless don't always uh, adopt a forthright manner in dealing with the meaning of racial difference. Um, and one way of explaining this is to think of the, the way that we fall back on to food in discussions about differences here in Australia. Um, the, you know, to give you an example, March 21st is the uh, International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, we know it better in Australia as Harmony Day. Uh, and on Harmony Day, in so many workplaces across the country, you would have had potluck lunches where people would have been encouraged to maybe bring a, a dish reflecting their ancestry to work. Uh, maybe they would have been invited to uh, wear something uh, ancestral as well by way of costume, um, because this is, you know, the way we think that we we can deal with uh, with race. Uh, we we should sit down, uh, break some bread or or share a, a curry or uh, or some fried rice, and uh, differences will melt away. We can we can eat our way through this, right? <laughs> um, I wish we could eat our way through this. Um, if if only it were that if only it were that simple. Um, uh, but, but this is what I, this is kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about um, here, the, the, the reluctance to go beyond the superficiality. Um, you know, uh, I, I will bet you that uh, most people will go through Harmony Day and not even know that it's the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, I remind audiences all the time in March that the day commemorates the Sharpeville Massacre in South Africa where protesters against apartheid were fired upon by South African police. 69 people died. Many of them had bullet wounds in their back. Um, that's a very different ring to the 21st of March than Harmony Day. But on colour blindness, I'm struck by some of the research that has been done by social psychologists, social psychologists uh, which illustrate the vital importance of being able to talk about racial differences. Um, one study by Bridget Vitrip uh, of the University of Texas, Austin, is particularly noteworthy in my view. Uh, in Vitrip's study, about 100 families, all of whom were Caucasian with a child five to seven years old, were recruited for a study about racial attitudes. And Vitrip and her team divided uh, the, groups, uh, the, the, the families up into uh, three groups. Uh, one group uh, was given 
um, uh, 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 the task of giving their children a survey which asks questions about their attitudes towards different group. Uh, a second group involved the researcher assigning families with certain tasks, um, including, for example, watching multicultural themed videos for a week. Um, another group um, was, was asked not only to watch those videos, but to discuss interracial friendship. Uh, another uh, group within that second group was asked um, to discuss racial equality on their own, but were given no videos. Um, and here's where the story gets really interesting, because the research project basically broke down at this point. Uh, the researcher was confronted with the problem uh, of families not complying with the instructions. Uh, namely, there were families who were asked to talk about race who didn't, and five of those families, in fact, left the study. Uh, and they left the study because they didn't want to have conversations about race with their child, and they didn't want to point out skin colour um, to their child. Um, the, the problems began to build um, for Vietrip and her team. Uh, the families in the study that were invited, that, that were asked to watch multicultural themed videos were invited back to a lab for, for retesting of their attitudes. Um, but the retesting found that three groups of children failed to exhibit uh, the three groups of children failed to exhibit any change in their attitudes. Um, when in, an investigation was conducted as to why, it became quickly apparent that uh, the parents didn't comply with the instructions. So they um, uh, actually didn't follow through with talking about race with their children. Um, many of the participating uh, parents would later admit that they didn't know what to say to their children about race, and they didn't want to say the wrong thing. Uh, and here I, uh, this is, this is the, the crux of the colour blindness problem for me. I, I think of the hypothetical example in, in the shopping centre or, or, or the supermarket at the checkout counter. Um, and let's imagine you've got a, a three or four year old kid there. Uh, and let's imagine in a very loud voice the child uh, decides to declare that the man in front or the woman in front uh, has certain coloured skin or has facial features that look funny or has a certain texture to their hair. Um, let's imagine what the parent then does in that scenario. Uh, I would imagine that the vast majority of parents when confronted with that would probably tell their child just to keep quiet, not to say anything, and would be ridden with embarrassment and mortification. Um, but think about the message that's sending to the child. It's saying to the child that this is taboo, or that racial differences are bad, you're not meant to talk about these things. Uh, the way that a more literate society on race would deal with such scenarios would be for the parent to actually take the opportunity to talk to their child about the differences that the child's seeing, you know, explain to the child, yes, that man has a different skin colour to us. That's because our skin colour reflects where we've come from or our heritage. And we come from X heritage. Uh, Using it as a way of opening up a conversation uh, is, to me, the test of a more literate society on these things. But returning to, to Vitrip and this research, for the minority of parents who did follow through with the instructions, uh, the results were quite striking. The research exercise found that there was a dramatic improvement in racial attitudes in just a single week among those families that managed to talk openly about interracial friendship as prescribed. Um, in other words, the default barrier of we don't see race or I don't see colour gets in the way of dealing with the problem. A colour blind approach or difference blind approach uh, is flawed. Um, and I think the research indicates to me that uh, the, uh, the, the, there, there, are there are solid grounds for believing this to be the case. Um, well, around America, I think it's very interesting to note some of the developments there, particularly in schooling. Uh, uh, among other places, I know in New York City, a number of uh, liberal and progressive private schools there have sought to incorporate into their curriculum teaching about racism uh, and, and privilege. Um, you know, I think again of the controversy just in the last week of uh, of, of of, um, uh, of, of, of how you, 
you've had, for example, a school in uh, Lumia here in New South Wales that has um, set an assignment for kids to talk uh, about the barriers faced by Muslim people in society only for uh, a backlash from parents to see a revision uh, to that. Uh, but there in New York, uh, you've had students in elementary or primary schools breaking off into small groups based on their background, talking about race and talking about difference. Uh, and, and, and the one thing that's very apparent to me is that if we're talking about color blindness, uh, the luxury of declaring that you can be blind to color is not a luxury that everyone enjoys. Uh, there are some parents who can afford or go through bringing up their child without having to talk about race. But not everyone has that choice. Uh, for, for many others, you have to talk about race. Uh, it's important that you teach your child how to respond, for example, to police, because it might involve a question of life or death. Uh, you know, just because uh, you might be able to say that you're blind to, to, to race doesn't mean that others uh, have the luxury of, of, of living as though race doesn't matter. Um, I want now just to uh, conclude uh, on uh, denials and deflections about racism uh, and the, the many ways in, in, in which conversations about racism can be derailed. Uh, and, and we need to have the wherewithal and the skills to know what is happening because quite often those on the receiving end of racism second guess and doubt what is happening. And, and this is part of the stratagem for, for people to, uh, to, to either deny or deflect uh, racism. Uh, I'll highlight three elements of, of denial when it comes to the presence of racism. Um, one is simply gaslighting, or uh, the, the stance on the part of some who just frankly deny to your face and make you think that you are imagining things, that you are uh, concocting a reality that simply does not exist, a very bold-faced response to racism. That's racist. No, you're imagining it. I didn't see it. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Right? Um, I'm, I'm sure some of us have been in that scenario before or, or been in exchanges like that before. Uh, you've got another form of denial in the form of, um, it didn't happen to me, so therefore it doesn't exist. Uh, last year, we released a number of videos about everyday and casual racism, which we ran on social media and also as community service announcements on television. Um, but it was interesting, you know, as a general rule, I don't read the comments. Uh, but curiosity got the better of me on, on this occasion, and, and I wanted to know genuinely how people were responding to these videos. Um, and, and I think overall, the response was positive. Uh, but nonetheless, there was a significant a uh, number of people who, who took exception to our videos. Uh, but one of the things that frequently came through the responses, which was notable, was the sentiment that I have never seen anything like this happen. So this is fabricated racism. This simply does not exist. I have never seen anyone treat another person that way before. So therefore, it does not exist. I've never seen a murder happen before. I know that murder exists, uh, but the same logic doesn't apply for, for, for racism. Uh, a third form of denial is, is class. By that I mean the idea that, well, what you describe as racism is not racism. What you're describing is class-based ignorance or a lack of education. Um, I find it fascinating looking at the American experience at the moment and how people have tried to make sense of the Trump presidency. And I see, <laughs> we're all trying to make sense of it. Uh, but, but what's really interesting is how an orthodox or conventional wisdom has emerged, particularly among the journalistic class and commentariat in America about how class was the driving factor behind uh, the Trump victory. Um, now, we, we know it's a lot more complicated uh, than that, um, that there might have been 
manipulation of, uh, of the election by nefarious forces, for example. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a very dominant strand in the commentary, or at least has been. Uh, I think about Australia and how some of this sentiment has also taken hold in progressive commentary about the culture wars and identity politics here as well. Uh, many of you may have seen a much cited essay by the writer Shannon Burns in Mianjin, where he has argued that the progressive middle class political discourse in Australia has alienated lower class white Australians. Um, to cite some of his language, he has said that middle class grievances about racism and bigotry now drown out lower class pain, which explains why, and I quote, the wounded lower classes come to embrace conservative discourses that ridicule middle class anguish. Um, now, if there's any kind of backlash against so-called political correctness, he says, it is because uh, those who cannot afford to see themselves as disadvantaged are instinctively repulsed by those who harp on about disadvantage. Um, a really interesting challenge, I think, for us to think about. Uh, there are the deflections about race. So there are denials, and then there are deflections. Um, one of them, scholars have referred to, one form of them, scholars have referred to as spatial deflections. Um, I, I get this all the time, and people will say to me, why is it that you focus so much on racism in Australia? I mean, there's a simple answer to that, um, uh, but bear with me. Um, why, why aren't you talking about racism in China or Japan? Because if you're really interested in racism, you'd be dealing with racism over there. Note the deflection, right? You know, then there's the moral high ground deflection about racism, which is related to this spatial element, which is to say, what you're really talking, what you're talking about, sure, it's not great, but it's not really racism. It's not truly racism. The implication being that if you really cared about racism, you wouldn't be wasting your time talking about these trivial matters that you're identifying. You'd be dealing with the real stuff. Again, deflecting. And then there's what I call the race as a social construct deflection. Um, and this is a really interesting one. Uh, people will say, why are you even talking about racism when race doesn't exist? I mean, you know that race isn't a biological construct, a biological category, right? I mean, you would accept that race is a social construct, wouldn't you? Yes, that's right. So why are you even talking about it if it's a construct and it's by implication, imaginary. Um, now, all manner of things are constructs. Laws are constructs. Hospitals are social constructs. Workplaces are social constructs. When you take away physical things, the idea of laws, hospitals, and workplaces are indeed social constructs at one level. But being a social construct does not make something imaginary. It's still real. Laws are still real. Hospitals are still real. Workplaces are still real. But again, you see how the deflection uh, is made there. Uh, let me conclude on how we, we've got to make sense of all, uh, 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 of all this. Uh, and, and, and like I said at the outset, I, I don't have a glib or easy prescription for you. Um, and that's because the task of countering racism and fostering understanding is, is an ongoing one. Uh, but I think we can have a few general principles that can guide us on how we conduct our conversations. Uh, one is that we've got to move beyond this idea that racism is just about racial superiority or about racial doctrine. Um, it's not. Uh, we can't just talk about intentions or motive We've also got to talk about impact and effect. Second principle, don't get too defensive. You've got to hold your ground if you want to deal with this problem. Race can be uncomfortable. People will feel discomfort in talking about this. Good. They should feel uncomfortable. And if you think talking about race is uncomfortable, then what about experiencing racism and the discomfort of experiencing 
racism. A momentary experience of discomfort is a good thing if it results uh, in enlightenment and change behaviour. Um, third, we've got to avoid giving any ground and saying that copying racism is just a part of life and might need to be the price of entry into society. Um, I, I hear this quite often when it concerns, for example, racism directed at those from migrant backgrounds. Uh, and it comes in the form of people saying, well, look, the Irish copped it when they came here. So did the Italians. So did the Greeks. They're OK now. You know, the Vietnamese and Chinese copped it too. So, you know, Muslim people and Middle Eastern people and African people who've come here as migrants, they, they will in time come good. But they will need to uh, understand that this is part of the initiation rite they have to go through. Now, I think that normalises racism and it's never good enough just to tell people that they should grin and bear it. Um, if we are such a multicultural success story, I would have thought we would have got better at uh, dealing with new arrivals and how we initiate them into the national culture. Uh, finally, uh, racism matters to all of us. Uh, it implicates all of us and it shouldn't just be left to those who are its targets to deal or respond to racism. Uh, and that's, I think, the biggest challenge uh, for, for all of us uh, and for all of you who are working with cultural competence uh, in institutions and organisations how do you get people who don't experience disadvantage or discrimination to understand it? Um, and that, I hope, is, uh, is, is a challenge that you'll reflect on at this conference. And uh, I hope that uh, wiser heads than me will be able to give you um, uh, some answers over today and tomorrow.